Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Tortoise. Uh, my name is Giles Wittell. I'm an editor at Tortoise and this is our regular Friday lunchtime Sensemaker Live thinking supported by Santander. So thank you very much Santander. Um, I think of this as a collision of news that you might recognize as news, breaking news, fast news, and news that we specialize in at Tortoise, news that we slow down, slow news. Um, but uh, today we're talking about not so much a, a one-off news story as a, a rolling mess or a disaster or a letdown or catastrophe. I don't know. We'll find out what, what you think about it. We're going to talk about the hell that students are enduring coping with COVID uh, in lockdown? Or, or is it hell? Um, are you really imprisoned? Are you, are they really imprisoned in halls of residence as we sometimes see uh, on news broadcasts and uh, courtesy of posters put up in windows? Or are you in fact busy making friends for life? Um, are you going quietly desperate? or optimistic that it'll all pan out pretty soon, or at least in the end. Um, it seems to me, and I will uh, stop wibbling on quite soon, that there are broadly two ways of looking at this. One is we're all in this together. Ultimately, uh, it's nobody's fault. It would be churlish to presume that people were deliberately trying to make it worse for any sector of society. Um, and. Uh, we'll get through it in the end. The other is that students in lockdown on campuses in the UK in particular at the moment are victims of a really massive failure of leadership for which they are being made to pay in cold hard cash at precisely the moment when they can least afford it. Sometimes not just normal rates either but inflated rates and a refund which is what we talk about in the sort of overarching question today, grin and bear it or demand a refund, is frankly the least that students in the UK now deserve. We have um, what they call in late night American TV, a great show uh, today. We've got guests from the front line who we'll hear from in just a second. We've got a slideshow and we've even got a care package. Uh, we're gonna do some unwrapping. Um, but first, let me just explain, I, I think there are probably quite a few people on this call who've never been to a tortoise thinking before. So very briefly, the idea is for us all to learn from each other. We do have some guests, but uh, I really want everybody to pitch in who has anything to get off their chests. You can do that in two ways. One is by uh, clicking on the participants button on the black strip at the bottom of your screen. You will then see a list of everybody who's on the call and the bottom right hand corner, there's a raise hand button and uh, you can touch that and we will have a practice run with that in just a second. The alternative is to chat in the chat where my colleague Liz, the mighty Liz is, she's not in charge, but she's um, encouraging you, goading you on. And we are gonna come to her with a crazy new camera shot uh, as well uh, for a, a special innovation. Um, but first, just to show you're paying attention, um, those two ways of looking at what's going on at the moment, can you please go to your raise hand button and raise it if you broadly agree with the first way of looking at it that I outlined? It's not particularly anyone's fault. We're all in this together. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Interesting. My goodness. Ellie, that's just because you're no longer a student. Okay, that's really interesting. I have to admit more than I thought. Okay, um, if you can put your hands down and raise your hands if you think students in the UK at the moment, um, whether or not they're actually on one of the many campuses with a large COVID outbreak are uh, victims of a colossal failure of leadership. That is definitely 
a bigger number. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for listening enough to um, know how to use those raise hand buttons. Um, I want to come first, if I can, to Kyle Westrip, who's kindly joined us from the University of Lancaster, where he is running a petition. Kyle, can you tell us what's going on? What's the petition about? And how do you hope this pans out? Um, so essentially at, at Lancaster, we've had like an ongoing dispute over providing food to students. So the university wanted to charge people about 18 pound a day um, for food boxes. So if you're in self-isolation, you need to pay that. Um, and the problem is essentially that there aren't enough online delivery slots for there to be an alternative to that for a lot of people. So that was forcing a lot of people to, you know, pay through the nose for what is essentially a meal consisting of um, like two cold meals. So that's a lunch and a breakfast and then a reheatable dinner. And if you work that out per month, that's about £480 a month if you were to have to self-isolate for that long. And it's £124 a week. So that's roughly the equivalent of my rent here at Lancaster. Um, so we started up a petition essentially saying the university needs to at least charge this at an affordable rate, right? It needs to be charged um, either at the cost of delivery or if the university are insisting that they have to make some money from it, um, that needs to be a, something that could reasonably be paid by the average student. Um, and yeah, the petition's just completely blown up over the past couple of days. It's on 2000 signatures at the moment and we've got local news contacting us. Um, yeah, like a lot of engagement around it. So all those signatures are of, from students. Do you have to be a student to sign? You don't need to be a student to sign, no. Um, but I would say about 50, 60% are students here at Lancaster. And then a lot of the others are students elsewhere in the country. Okay, now uh, on your press release, you've done some arithmetic and worked out what you think the cost of the food that you're being offered is. What's that? Um, I'd have to double check it again, but roughly we figured out you could Okay, if you were to bulk buy the ingredients um, in one go, it does come out to about 13, 14 pound on Asda. Um, but when you break that down into a number of portions, it comes to something very, very low, like two pounds 70. So we looked online and we, we tried to be reasonable and say, well, what is the kind of industry wide average cost of distributing that food, right? Or to cook it, what is the added value? And we didn't get any higher than four pound as being mm -hmm. the max amount it could it could cost to do. So all your that. basic claim is that you're being gouged uh, 14 quid a day. Yes. Yeah. And sorry, just to be clear, how many of your fellow students are paying this 17.95 a day? And, and what are the alternatives? Um, so. Not that many people are paying it currently, because first of all, we've only got a fairly small number of people in self-isolation at the moment, though it's going up rapidly. And because of this petition, the local Labour Party, local Labour Club offered to provide food. Um, the Students' Union have offered to sell food boxes. So those are about 20 pound. Um, and those That's not much better, is it? In fact, it is worse. But those feed you for a week. Ah. So that's a, that was a big improvement. So very few people have ended up buying these food boxes, um, which, is a, which is a good thing. Okay. Uh, but the problem remains, I think, that a lot of people who don't say have cookware, right, their international students have just arrived or are very sick, there's now no alternative to them. So we've got people on the campus who say they're too sick to cook food for themselves. They're relying on charity. Um, they're relying on other people to do it for them whilst paying 9,000 a year, yeah. which we still find completely unacceptable. Right, right. Um, I want to come in a minute to, to our slides. I think it would be good to, to get to them quite quickly. But first, is, is Elif Ozer from SOAS uh, with us? Because um, I'd like to come to you if you are there. Elif? 
I don't think she's quite joined us yet, Giles. Okay, no worries. Sorry. No worries. Well, look, uh, my colleague Phoebe. By the way, Phoebe, are you are you running the chat as well? Um, yes, it's a me, I'm sorry. both me and Liz are running the chat, but that's okay. okay. We've got lots of chats to have. Okay, well let, let's let's run the slides now because this is this is a moving picture. The um, uh, num case numbers are going up. The number of uh, uh, campuses with cases. Talk us through these slides so we know where we are. Yeah, of course. So this first slide here for you guys is the universities currently with coronavirus infections. Um, we've had a bit of fun this week as it keeps being updated as, as we've kind of gone through the week. Um, and you can see that there are 72 uh, universities with infections in England. Uh, and there's a total of 93 that have reported cases. Um, bit of context, last week this was at 70. So yeah, that rapid infection um, has happened. And, and there you can see Newcastle and Northumbria with 2,483 cases as of yesterday that they've now reported. Um, and those, those three unis, also Sheffield and Manchester, have moved to, have moved to uh, no face-to-face -face teaching, um, clearly because of the infection rate. Um, and the next slide. Um, and then what you see here is, is an ONS infection survey. So it's the estimated percentage of each age group testing positive for COVID-19. So you can see that 17 to 24. So clearly this is not just university students. This is also kind of touches on that sixth form edge. But you can see it really clearly spike up um, from mid-September when universities went back. And this is only up to the 24th of September, this data. So we can kind of expect based on those infections from the previous slide that this is going to keep going up um, as infection rate continues to go um, increase as more universities see those infection rates. And then the next slide. Yeah, so it's kind of a, th a term that's thrown around a bit, you know, at the beginning of everything, everyone's like, well, you know, all these university students moving around the country. Um, and this kind of just puts that in a bit of perspective. So according about from 2014-2015 data, 74.4% of full-time UK students moved house. Um, and then this is the stats for last year of how many of those students moved around. So you can see there's a big movement of, of people across the country. Um, and of course, they might have been affected once they arrived at university, but it can kind of show how much that, that infection has been moving around the country in a different way than a commuter who's just going in and out of the centre of London would. And then the next slide. So yeah, so something I'm sure we will talk about um, and Charles kind of touched on was the cost of a university degree. So with the TEF Gold universities, tuitions at 9,250, living costs on run on average 38,800. Of course, that could be more, that could be less and rent about 4,900. And that's excluding London rent and some other cities with which where rent can really skyrocket. Um, and on average, your maintenance loan and tuition fee loan, as I'm sure many of you will know, will only hit about 60 thousand pounds of that and clearly most of that going towards tuition so for all those students who do part-time jobs extra work or need parental income that's a really hard position to be in especially if you're in self-isolation I know myself when I was a student I'd have struggled to pay for my degree if I couldn't part-time work so it just kind of shows that huge overstep and, and you know what that petition was saying I, up in Lancaster this is a real problem for many students and then the next slide so what do the universities think? So we've kind of pulled this quote from Tuesday, Professor Julia Buckingham. Um, she was speaking as president of Universities UK, the group of 139 universities across um, the UK for you and, you know, saying, I'm sure there are cases where things haven't gone quite as well, but I, as we'd have hoped, but I'm confident the vast majority of students are being very, very well supported by the universities. And I guess as we go through this, there'll be some students who may disagree or agree with this. Um, and then a bit of a change for our final slide. We've actually got some images that were sent to us, um, to one of our torches team. These images of some of those meals um, in Durham University, as you can see, packs of soup, crisps, drunk food, um, and all they've got is a microwave and a kettle because it's a self, often self-catered accommodation at Durham. So this is the kind of food that's being sent out to these students who are paying this amount of money. And if they are in self-catered, they're often paying more money to have that hot food that's usually given to them in a canteen style. So I think across the board, you can kind of see that there's this huge like, disagreement between what the universities are saying and what students are coming forward and saying is the real situation. 
VB, uh, thank you very much from the heart from somebody who was very recently a, a student yourself. Now, hold those images in mind for the purposes of comparison, because not just yet, but we're going to come to uh, a, another sample care package and do some unwrapping, unboxing in a second. I wanted, if possible, first, though, to come to Josh, uh, Josh Sandiford a student at Manchester and also a student journalist. Hi, Josh. Hi now, am I right that you have been writing, among other things, about raves? Okay. <laughs> now, yes. I, I, would, I would love to know, by the way, your response to that Julia Buckingham quote that, um, that uh, broadly speaking, she feels that it is probably the case that students are being well looked after. I'd like to know your response to that, but I'd also like to know from your experience of the reporting that you've been doing um illegal raves you know cheek to cheek um are students blameless in all this or do they have to shoulder some of it it's, it's hard to know how many students are actually following the rules and how many are not um i sort of in the week or two when everyone came back it was sort of every single day wall to wall big parties in halls big raves lots of people getting together and then for some reason it just sort of dropped off completely it stopped and I, we sort of had to ask the question what's gone on here where have all the parties gone why is nobody raving anymore um and we looked into it and it was genuinely because everybody was ill and everybody was self-isolating um and it was particularly interesting that if you looked over the road at, at manchester metropolitan university they had sort of big burly security guards outside their blocks keeping them there whereas in Manchester people were genuinely self-isolating because they were not very well and doing the right thing and then sort of bringing myself onto the question of if they were being looked after by the university there were all sorts of reports of you know the university telling students to do the wrong thing telling self-isolating households that they could go out and go and get food when that's against government guidelines um reports of people having to sort of wash clothes in sinks because they couldn't go to the laundry um not being able to get food and i think if you are a first year fresher as well you don't have those support networks you don't have any friends you don't have bubbles and people who can sort of go out and do that for you so i think a lot of um, first years will have felt quite let down by the university's response Right. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, but just coming back to the, the difference that you noticed between Manchester and Manchester Met, mm -hmm. um, and you found that the basic reason people were no longer partying at Manchester University were they were ill. Yes. Are you saying that, that there was less prevalence in Manchester Met and they were carrying on partying and that's why they needed burly people on the doors? I don't know. I think Man Met sort of just jumped on it really quickly and made sure that nobody could go out and locked it down. Whereas in, in Manchester Uni Halls in Fallowfield, which is the main area everyone sort of lives in, there just wasn't any need for it because people had stopped going out. So I, I, I don't know if Man Met had carried on partying, but um, at, at Manchester Uni it slowed down genuinely because everybody couldn't go out anymore because they were all so sick. Okay. And um, what do we know about why they were sick i mean let's be let's be brutally candid about this did a lot of people get sick by going to raves i think so yes most of the students i've spoke to said that they sort of you know even if they'd gone to like small little flat parties or just mixed in a way they weren't supposed to it was just going around so quickly and it was almost a kind of experiment in how rapid the virus can spread amongst a small community because um basically everybody i spoke to said not only is my entire flat self-isolating but my entire block um, one student said to me that they had um i think 10 flats in their block with 10 students in each and he believed every single person was was isolating in there so it really was raging through uh, campus among first years and actually the, the whole area because um fallowfield where the students where most manchester students live has become the the covid hotspot of the country and i think it has the the most cases per hundred thousand of, of anywhere mm. have you had it no, I, I, I should have said I haven't actually made it to campus yet. I'm still stuck at home in Birmingham because <laughs> people in my yeah people in my Manchester house have, have come down with symptoms, so I haven't made it there. And um, sorry if I'm going on ever so slightly, but it's sort of the the, the part about fees and costs. Um, I've paid hundreds of pounds in rent for a house that I've not yet seen because I haven't made it back to, to Manchester. And I think um, there's going to be a lot of talk of fees, but the hard, the hard hard cold cash that comes out of your account every single month in rent if there's a, a national lockdown and people go back home to their families there's a you know people might be stuck in rent traps and, and paying these costs for the, for the foreseeable future right now from the observation that you and your 
it's, it's the Mancunian, is it? What's the name of the newspaper? Yes, that's, that's our student newspaper, the Mancunian. Yeah. That you've been able to do. Do you get the impression that this wave who got it at the start of term are going to come out of it at roughly the same time? I mean, is there some hope that in a week or two, everybody who was laid up in bed is going to be tentatively coming out of the corridor and saying, how do you feel? Ooh, should we go to Tesco? Maybe, yeah, I think so. I think people are just going to try and get on with it and hope if, if they have no symptoms, they're going to sort of try and get on with their normal uni life. Right. One more question about Manchester, even though you're not physically there. A colleague, my, my colleague Michelle, was saying uh, that it was from there, that or thereabouts, uh, that uh, friends um, had seen that in the North Quarter, uh, pubs have been saying um, in a show of defiance to government, the latest government guidelines on pub closures, uh, nuts to that, we're going to put up marquees in the street so that we can continue to um, serve people in a, in a socially distanced way. Have you, are you aware of that? Do you know if, if there's going to be buy-in from Manchester's massive student population? That's not something I've heard, but from my three years as a student journalist, it wouldn't surprise me if students didn't go out and take advantage of that if it was a thing being offered. Right. Okay, uh, uh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. And I, I hope that um, this uh, experiment that you describe uh, pans out well. Um, can we, uh, maybe, maybe now is the time, um, Liz, to do some unboxing. So uh, this is another example. Well, Liz, you tell us what's going on. So um, this is my moment. I'm going to go full QVC, everyone. I'm beside myself with excitement. So what we've got is, and I've just been frantically, it was very helpful when somebody in the chat mentioned the £420 for 14 days of food at Sussex, because I've just managed to look up that this box that we've got is from the company that are providing the boxes to Sussex. Sussex is, Sussex is one of the, the, the universities there. A company called uh, Chartwells, owned by a huge food and catering company called Compass that do like massive sporting venues and lots and lots of different places. And they supply, I think, 20 universities. And uh, Sussex is one of them. Sorry, they do De Montfort in Leicester, Middlesex as well, Salford, lots and lots of big universities. And what we have here is... Um, a meal box um, that you can buy, obviously. Um, I, th I think, looking just now at their website with the meal plan options, I think what we've got is the £30 per person per day version. And I'm going to open it and have a look inside. So if um, Sam changes the camera angle so that you can see, and if you can see, the, can you see the top of the box? Where do I show it? It's very trendy. It says, Simple AF, simple tasty nom, all of the good stuff. It's telling me that it's fully compostable, quite smart. Um, and let's see, let's see what we get for our 30 quid a day. How will I do this? So let's go to the smallest one first. It tells me to recycle it. What have we got in here? Okay, this is breakfast. I'm getting Tropicana. I've got a jumbo oat porridge there. Nice. An apple and a pastry, nice. It's a good pop, that's a good breakfast for anybody. I bet this is lunch. Oh, we've got some recipe cards telling me how to cook carbonara and katsu curry and fish tacos. Perhaps one of those is going to be the dinner. And then this is this is lunch. I've got some coke, a water. Brownie sort of thing, tipping maybe, and a baguette. Harissa chicken salad baguette. Quite big, doesn't look that nice, but reasonable lunch, I guess. I'm not sure if it's 30 quid worth of lunch. And then I think it must be the dinner. What's in here? I'm not going to open. Thai green curry for dinner. Recipe card. Let's see how much. Oh, it's got an allergens um, leaflet telling me exactly what's in it and the allergens to avoid. Nicely put together. 
and then it does say yeah you do you would need a proper kitchen it says you know put the the rice we've got the rice here from the chicken curry boil the rice this has to go in a saucepan so it's relatively straightforward um but these ones they're asking me to chop um baking tray you would need pan you would need a sort of a reasonably not a full kitchen but you'd certainly need a proper kitchen to make a go of it it has to go in the fridge as well it says you've got to refrigerate it when you get it um but i don't know is that worth 30 quid a day I mean, and who can afford 30 quid a day quite pricey i'd say yeah but i mean if they were going to give this to me in self-isolation I think that's a reasonable amount of food if I can't go out, if that's going to come as a care package, as you say. But if it's a upmarket, you know, ready-made meal plan, it's quite, I would say it's a bit out of reach for most people. That's well, what I would get. Liz, thank you so much. I do, I do think you have a, a future in the online thank unboxing you, universe. It was just a fantastic attention to detail. Thank you so much. <laughs> But 30 quid a day, I mean, heavens, that's, that's double what they're trying to get people to pay in, in, in Lancaster. 420 quid for two weeks that you can eat like that. It's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we were all given disaster funding, then, then perhaps. Um, yeah. I'd like to uh, come to David Kernahan for the sort of, if, if you'll forgive me, the institutional point of view, uh, and then... And then um, uh, Andy Walton in the chat was talking about his experience up at Edinburgh. I'd love to come to you in a second. But um, David, you are an associate editor at Wonky uh, and you write about this stuff um, for an, a, a readership largely working in further and higher educational institutions. Um, one reason, obviously, for unis to encourage students to show up is to secure their revenue and one of the things that i see you've written about is is actually the process of bankruptcy for for um uh, higher educational institutions go, going out of business how serious is this from the point of view of just the educational infrastructure of the country um the troubling thing at the matter in answer to your last question is that we don't know uh we don't have the data but i just want to rewind a bit and First of all, offer my sympathies to all of the students that are in this situation. This is an absolute nightmare. It should not be happening. And it's made all the worse by the fact that everybody could see it coming. Everybody knew that this was going to happen and it doesn't feel like enough has been done. Um, in terms of the risk to the sector overall, as people probably know, um, a university gets most of its income from one of two sources. This would be income related to tuition. So that's either tuition fees or additional money that they get from teaching for the office of student or from government or from, from somewhere else and research income. For the majority of universities, the tuition fees are the overwhelming point of income. Anything else that they're making, say accommodation, or uh, catering or stuff like that is dwarfed by uh, tuition fees. So if you go back to uh, March or April, a bunch of people were saying, indeed, I think I even wrote on the site back in March or April, not that it matters, there was various campaigns. Let's get a proper bailout for universities because that would mean that we would not be bringing back students in September, October, in order that a university could uh, five. As I say, we don't have the data yet on which students have actually turned up. If you are a student, if you look around your hall, you'll probably see a lot of students that are just, that have just not ever shown up. Some of them are trying to get involved uh, remotely. Some are just not ever going to get there. They're just never going to enroll. Uh, so the, each one of those students that uh, never actually enrolls or uh, drops out before they come, uh, become liable for the fee loan, which is somewhere in between 14 days and a month after enrollment for the majority of institutions. That is um, 
fee income over three years that a university is not going to get. Now, uh, this adds up quite quickly. The principal thing that um, a university spends money on is the salaries of academic staff and support staff. So the people that you deal with um, um, every day as a student. If a, stu um, a university loses income, it has literally uh, nothing else it can realistically do other than start to cut staffing. Uh, we're al already starting to see that happening in a number of places. I saw an article this morning about Royal Holloway, about Portsmouth, there's tons of places that are already cutting staff. Uh, Phoebe in the chat, she raises the idea of deferment. Now this is something that you do before you get to university. You ring up your university and you say, well actually I don't fancy coming to university this year, can I come next year? And your university will say yes or no. Uh, that was um, slightly up on previous years. We think that's because universities have said, actually, no, we can't defer because um, we're expecting, simply because of the demographics, the number of 18 year olds that are in uh, the UK and are likely to go to university is going up and up and up every year. It's going to start going up next year and it's a big shift. So, I mean, universities for next year are concerned about the, um, their capacity. So it would be actually quite difficult to obtain a deferral unless you got a really good reason. The David, other, can I just, sorry. sorry, can I just jump in there um, and, and rewind to what you were saying about students who, who simply don't, haven't turned up at the beginning of this term. It's a small point, but from an accounting point of view, after those three weeks or whatever have elapsed, are you saying that the universities uh, have to assume that they're not going to get that fee income for all three years for that student? Or do they keep open the possibility that it's a weird year and the student will, will show up next term, for example? Um, in, I mean, uh, we're talking about here about the processes at individual institutions, and obviously they vary from provider to uh, provider. Um, if a student hasn't turned up for their first year and they've not enrolled, the expectation is that they're no longer a student. So if they wanted to come along next year, they'd have to, uh, they'd have to reapply through UCAS or right. something like that to get a place. Um, I'm just spotting something coming through on the chat. People are starting to talk about the salaries of, uh, of vice chancellors and principals. Now, some of these people are paid a lot, uh, but even if you were to cut the vice chancellor's salary entirely in a struggling institution, it would not make any difference to the financial position of the university. Um, there are a lot of academic staff, a lot more academic staff, and it's, it is academic staff, and to a lesser extent, the support staff that is the bulk of a university's uh, cost. However attractive it might be to point at a vice chancellor's salary, uh, reducing that or getting rid of that is not really going to make much difference. And I uh, note that uh, lots of vice chancellors have already taken a voluntary pay cut. Um, so there was something else that came in in the chat. I just wanted to well, look. I tell you to, what. Sorry. By all means, I'll come back to you. But I, I want yeah. to come. I want to come back to students who've dialed Absolutely. in so that we yes. can Keep learn as much as we yeah. can about what they're actually living through. Is Ella Salmon with us from? Um, and I, I do want to come to um, Andy Walton as well. Is, is Ella with us from Edinburgh? Yeah. Hi. Ella. Yeah. Ella. Yeah. What's What's going on up there? Are you? Uh, allowed out and do you think you deserve a refund? So I'm not actually in halls, I'm in like a flat in Edinburgh. Um, I will, I'm currently in isolation so I'm not allowed out anyway as is most people I know up here. Um, do I think we deserve a refund? Like absolutely. I don't understand how the university is trying to justify this as um, the same standard of service that they've been providing before. Um, like they've always said that watching lectures online is not the same and is not the equivalent to seeing them in person and that's what we're doing now 
Um, they brought everyone here under the idea that we'd have hybrid learning, which would be a mixture of in-person and online learning. And there's, I mean, hardly any. I have an hour a week on Teams and that's um, the only contact I have with the university. So do you think that and you I were think, yeah. brought up under false pretenses? Yeah, completely, because they would have known, they told us, our timetables weren't given to us until we were up here and term started. Um, we were told that it would be a mixture of learning. There is for some subjects, but very few. And um, I feel like because they're providing less of a service, they can't charge the whole nine and a quarter grand. Mm -hmm. So what is happening in terms of sort of collective uh, um, protest, activity, bargaining? How, how, what are students doing or what are others doing on your behalf to make make this case and how do, how do you think it will in practical terms pan out do you think you'll get a refund i feel like the responsibility for getting a refund is just being passed around because there have been petitions going around asking the government for a refund mm -hmm. and the government have just responded saying if the university feel like they're giving you the full value then you like it's the university's problem you have to go to them and the university have just said we're providing the equivalent service so there won't be a refund so um i don't understand why there's not government help right okay thank you very thank you well, let's stay with edinburgh for a second since i since i mentioned um andy walton i saw you were writing similar things in in the chat can we come to andy yeah i i echo exactly um, what was said that I feel like the university is almost perpetrated a fraud that we were told for six months there would be blended learning and they encourage people to come back to Edinburgh many people rented flats in Edinburgh many of which with the university which are hugely expensive and the contracts were quite hard to get out of and then I was told about a week before I came up here what my time job would be and I had one in-person thing a fortnight which is number capped anyway so I don't think I'm going to go into campus at all this year and that's on top of the fact that there are a huge amount of strikes um, last semester due to um, pay issues with the staff at the uni. So I think I've probably got about two months of university teaching time since January at this point in the year, for my 9,000. Um, how much have you looked into where the money might come from if the university were to engage uh, with this argument about uh, about a refund i mean from the vice chancellor's point of view if you're looking at um uh, insolvency uh, um, it, it may simply not be possible um personally i haven't looked into it a huge amount i don't think a full refund would necessarily be the best course of action because we are still getting a service but i think the service needs to be matched the price we're paying or vice versa um, and Quite frankly, Edinburgh is also a huge institution which has a huge events business. They rent out their flats and all to the festival. They make a huge amount from um, their rental agreements. So I think actually the amount that we pay each year would be a fairly low percentage of that. Right. Thank you very much. Kyle from uh, Lancaster has raised your hand so to uh, recognise that that should work let's go back to kyle and then ella if you if i cut you off in midstream you seem to have your hand up so we'll come back to you kyle first yeah i just wanted to echo like what um other people have been saying i mean the universities in a way haven't created this situation they had a need to get people back onto campus at the beginning of this year uh, the, sorry this october um or they would go insolvent right so i think a lot of people probably do recognize that and I think the responsibility ultimately does lie with the government here. Um, universities needed to be given some kind of bailout so that when it came to October, they weren't forced basically to take students on. But I would also agree with kind of what Andy and Ella, um, Ella were saying, that um, we, we're not getting the service that we pay for, right? We're paying £9,250 a year for what it, for a lot of people is just a streaming service. And then on top of that, we're incurring all of these other additional costs. Even if you forget about food boxes, um, I'm from London, for example, transport costs, uh, just general getting equipment to come up to university. So I think what would probably be best is to get a partial refund going and for universities to actually take their responsibilities to students 
seriously, right? That's what I would. That's what I would say. Right. Um, uh, David, I see you've raised your hand. What do you make of the partial refund idea? Uh, just uh, very quickly, as I say, the uh, majority of university spending is on staff costs, support staff, academic staff. If we saw um, a refund of, say, 20% of fees, which, of course, would go back to the student loans company and be um, written off students' uh, debt, which they start uh, paying back after they graduate. Uh, which 20% of staff do, do people feel should not be paid? Um, it's an emotive question, but I think it's an um, important one. Right. Interesting point. Um, as we make these arguments, we need to be aware that there is a human human cost uh, uh, at the other end. Um, in a minute, I'd like to, I, I see that Elif uh, is uh, in the participants list, and I'd like to come to you, Elif, uh, in a second because you're in London, as I understand it, and it's more expensive to be a student there than anywhere. And I'm intrigued to know whether that makes your situation even more difficult. But first, uh, Daniel Dipper's got your hand up, so Daniel, we'll come to you. Hello. Um, Hi, so yeah, I'm at Magdalen College, Oxford. I've also just become a total student ambassador. So hello, everyone. Um, and in terms of my experience, I seem to have been quite lucky so far, from the sound of it, actually. Um, so what I'm going to say is mostly quite a different story to what a lot of people have been having, because in terms of the food, they've said to us that the the food that we eat in a hall, if we can order that, and they will deliver it to our house, because I'm staying in a house with eleven other people. Um, I also deliver cold food as well. Um, I don't know if they're going to charge that or not. It's the same price as it is in a hall. So I think I'm spending about 10 to 12 pound a day on food. Um, and it's pretty good food. Um, and that's been really good. They've literally, I've got on my uh, wall, which I can't show to you, but there's a sign that basically says, if you have symptoms, this is exactly what you need to do. Um, so it's literally like step one, you need to book a test through the university. Step two, you need to self isolate. Step three, you need to email this uh, email address to get in touch with people um, and they will get welfare support for you. Make sure you've got food, provisions. If we've got parcels that turn up at the Porter's Lodge, um, if we email, they will get them delivered to us. Now, I haven't tested any of this myself because I've been here a week and so far, fingers crossed, it stays that way. I haven't had to isolate, um, but I would say that... Um, at least my college so far, things actually seem to be working quite well. Um, and in uh, terms of teaching, oh, sorry. <laughs> in terms of what? In, I was going to talk about teaching very quickly. Yeah, that's um, what I was going to ask about. How much uh, FaceTime are you getting? So um, all of my tutorials uh, so far are all meant to be in person. Um, I'm actually quite rare in my college because I've got half of my modules at other colleges this year. But all of those are meant to be in person um classes uh i have got i'm taking a module that's university controlled not college controlled that is online um but we're having a two-hour lecture on that every week and then we have an in-person tutorial for that and then in terms of lectures they are online um they promised us they'll be online for at least a week but they're encouraging us to watch them at the time they usually be um, but we do have some live ones because i think next week i've got because it's like our introductory lectures next week so if you've got questions and stuff, then uh, that they are all live. So we've got at least three or four of those that are live. Daniel, it may be hard to know the answer to this, but um, just coming back to the food and the fact that uh, you're having it delivered to your house. I mean, uh, this sounds at first um, uh, listening like uh, a classic case of a deep pocketed institution being able to deliver a service that is simply impossible almost anywhere else. Yeah, um, are, are Oxford and Cambridge colleges digging into endowments to to make this work, or um, how's it all being funded? I mean, we are getting because this college was already quite generous with its financial support anyway. Um, right. But they've upped the book grant for this year, which is being funded by old members of the college. So we'd usually get a hundred pounds book grant a year, but um, at least this term we can apply for a hundred pounds book grant. But they've already given us a one hundred pound book grant. In terms of the other services, I mean, a lot of the services were subsidised anyway. I mean, literally, we got our bills the other week and it literally had listed on it. This is how much it would have cost. But here are all of the subsidies that have been applied. Um, and that was just for accommodation. 
Um, so I would guess they are the into that, and they already have massive welfare teams. Um, right. So they're they're kind of they already had some of this capacity, and I think they're just using it differently. But as I say, I can't, I don't actually know what it's like in action because I have heard other colleges possibly aren't quite so great, but then Magdalen is one of the richest colleges at Oxford. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, I haven't got any personal experience of it yet, but I think as people have been saying in the chat, it is going to be an exception because they do have yeah. those sort of facilities to do that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Daniel. And, and uh, uh, lucky old you. <laughs> um, um, can we come to Elif? I'm intrigued by what's, what it's like in London. Elif. Because I'm also uh, told that you firmly believe you're entitled to, uh, should get a um, a refund. Are you there? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe this is one of those uh, video off. I'm getting a cup of tea or video. Anyway, never mind. Uh, well, look, let's come to Sam Ady, who uh, joined us even before the call. Sam. Hello. Hi. Um, hi. So, so where are you and what do you think about all this? I'm from Warwick and I kind of concur with what everyone's saying in the chat about how Oxford is a slight exception. Um, Warwick have been doing a really good job as well. and We've been quite lucky with how they're mixing. We have like lectures online and we have the option of seminars in person. Everything's been really good. Um, but before this, um, maker, I looked, did a bit of research. I found out that 15% of, of Cambridge's income comes from tuition fees. This compares to Nottingham and Trent's 81% income coming from trees. So it very much varies across universities, I think, depending on the services they can offer. Did you say you, Nottingham? Were you comparing yeah, Nottingham Cambridge and Nottingham? Trent, yeah, Nottingham yeah. and Trent rely 81% of their income from trees compared to yeah. Cambridge's 15%, um, which kind of shows the stark contrast between universities and what they can offer for different students. Yeah. Uh, and tell us a bit more about life uh, at Warwick in terms of um, uh, how many cases and how constrained you are in, in moving around at the moment. Um, at the moment, Warwick students seem to be very vigilant in counteracting it. So I run my courses football team. We're actually you, you run your what? My courses football team. Okay. Yeah, and we're actually having to run a second trial because so many freshers are staying in their halls because flatmates have symptoms. I think it's quite an incredible shift from them. Um, at the moment, there's only 26 active cases on campus. The thing, we're quite lucky in that sense. Things are kind of able to continue quite well. I'm obviously living off campus, so I don't know how it is to live on there. But it seems like people have been very vigilant and things are running quite smoothly so far. So I'm quite lucky in that sense. That's interesting. Okay. Um, now, Phoebe, uh, in the chat earlier on, was making an interesting point, and I wanted to know if anybody else, if anybody's had any experience of this. Uh, Phoebe, why don't you uh, say what you were saying in the chat ab about how locals are reacting to, um, to students pouring in? I mean, um, you're, you're asking the question, but have you come across reports of shaming or any other kinds of uh, hostility between sort of incoming student populations and locals? Yeah, so I think um, I've definitely seen some reports of it. And I know personally when I was at university that there was already, you know, about students drinking, et cetera. So I was, I was curious to see if anyone had, had seen that increase in that kind of fear. I know that specifically Durham have said that they're not allowing students off the main campus area. They're telling them not going to the main bit of the city. Clearly that's a lot easier if you're a first year student and in halls and for me, my second year house was way out of town and I would have to go through the town centre to either go to the shops or, or just to be in my local area. Um, and I definitely think that it, it's that blame thing. I think a couple of people have mentioned it. Um, I think someone who was at Edinburgh said that they felt they were blamed for the second wave. And, you know, that graph that we showed with that huge spike up, you know, is it, is it the 16 to 24 year olds fault that, that there's been this increase in infections or could have we have seen this coming and you could have drawn that graph two months ago because of the way that we knew people were coming back to term, to school, to universities and moving across the country in that way. So yeah, I'd really be interested in anyone's had a direct um, conversations with any locals in their area about that um, and, and those issues. Yeah, it's, it's striking, isn't it? That there was that very heartfelt 
um, remark from uh, Nicola Sturgeon last week, I think, uh, which they ran verbatim on the Today program, on the PM, uh, making clear that however extensive infection and in Scottish campuses, it wasn't the students fault. I'm not aware of any equivalent from Gavin Williamson so far, uh, or indeed uh, Boris Johnson. Um, we've got three hands up. Uh, I'd like to come, uh, before we run out of time, to uh, Isabella Rufati just to talk about um, the in international students experience. But first, uh, let, let's come back to Ella, Johnny Jenkins and uh, uh, Elif, uh, uh, who've all, all got their hands up. Let's start with Ella. Um, I just wanted to respond to Phoebe's point. Like in Edinburgh, we've had the students, their attentions particularly between English students in Edinburgh anyway. Um, but we've had some really nasty experiences of neighbours shouting into gardens like you're not welcome here, go home. Um, and lots of people have had that neighbours knocking on their door saying, go away. Um, and in Scotland, even though Nicola Sturgeon said that, it definitely feels like students are still being blamed. And I think it was 10 days ago now, students were banned from hospitality venues for the weekend and it just targeted students. And I feel like the government have shied away from singling like singling out any section of society um, but somehow it was okay to target students and they asked us back here so um, what were they expecting to happen it just felt it felt like we were being blamed and not the email from the university said we'll ban you from the university if you're caught breaking the rules and there wasn't even a paragraph at the beginning saying thank you we're sorry this isn't ideal and thank you for what you're doing right uh, while we're talking, I just want, I, I want to ask briefly about the alternatives. At uh, one end, you could have the universities closing um, with the loss of revenue on their part, loss of education on your part. And, and then at the other extreme, you could have them fully open, everybody getting it, including uh, teaching staff, some of whom are elderly and, and vulnerable. I mean, um, if, if we put aside, although it's an important point, the one about the sort of you being invited, um, uh, what do you make of the argument that actually the situation that you're in, it's messy, it's an un, it, it, it is an, a compromise that isn't working out, but there aren't many good alternatives? I think what's wrong is that we've been asked here effectively because they want our money still. Um, and somehow it's not the students' problem that the way that the universities are structured, they rely on student fees. Um, like the design of the higher education system isn't our fault. Mm -hmm. um, I think COVID's definitely highlighted that the fact that it is the like 18 year old students that fund university research. There's a problem with that anyway. Um, obviously, we don't want the universities to go under, we don't want to lose that education, but I don't think that's the alternative. I think the government spent so much money now and it's on the whole furlough scheme for businesses. Why, like, it seems like that should have been an equivalent for students. Mm -hmm. Fair point, thanks a lot. Um, Johnny Jenkins, let's come to you since you've raised your hand. Yeah, hi. Sorry, yeah, yeah. hi. Uh, so I'm at Warwick and I was with a friend yesterday who said that she was out with her housemates going for a meal in Leamington Spa, which is where a lot of us live. And she was stopped by people she described as the COVID police with um, their high vis jackets on who stopped them to say, do you live together? Are you, are you going out? You've got to be careful. And we don't know who these authorities were, but there's certainly people parading up and down Leamington telling people to, to break up if, if they don't live together. So these were obviously not police. Did they have any sort of community service officer badging or were they vigilantes as far as you could tell or your friends could tell? As far as I understand, they are vigilantes with high vis jackets that they want something to do of an evening. Um, but, but they don't seem to, they were described as COVID police. That's how everyone's talking about them. Okay. But from what you say, it didn't come to blows. It, it was a conversation. Yeah, that they were just stopping groups of, of young people on the street saying, do you live together? Be careful. Um, because I think the locals would be quite worried um, about rising cases. I mean, you would be, wouldn't you, if you had loads of students yeah. and, and the locals yeah. have been doing a good job so far. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's try and get to as many people as possible. Elif, you've raised your hand. Thank you. 
Hello. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there was a uh, there was a, a problem with the connection. So um, I'm Elif. I'm uh, studying in SOAS University of London, and I'm doing politics and international relations. I'm in my third year, and right now I'm gonna talk from like I'm gonna come from a perspective of international student, like uh, as I'm paying the double of the fee as an uh, as an international student, nearly I pay eighteen thousand pound for like annual fee, and the fees are uh, actually. Um, not fair and most of significantly I feel like it's not for, uh, fair for an international student because we're not getting the same experience and we just uh, also I think university is more than just like learning learning about the course and the modules it's more about the experience itself and I feel like as an international student as I pointed out before it's not for, fair for us and also I would like to point out that this uh, annual fee is uh, the accommodation is not included. Right. So, so Elif, just... how much in total are you spending to be a student in London? Uh, if you include everything, tuition, accommodation and food. So for the university. So, OK, I will start with the uh, university fee. I'll pay like around £18,000 for just yeah. for university and accommodation. Uh, I have my own flat with my sister. I'm living with my sister. Right. So I'll say uh, per year. I, yeah. And it's, I just don't know my expenses as, as well. It, uh, and how much contact time do you have uh, per week? For per international week? student right now. And, sorry. How much contact I time? I couldn't hear that. Which, sorry. I'm sorry. How much contact time with teachers do you have per week? So per week, uh, so according to my timetable, I got uh, so uh, three days of of the week. Um, I have my lectures and tutorials, and they're, yeah. and they're happening as normal. Yes, it's happening as normal. But as I told you, like the experience itself, it's not the same. It's just like yeah. I feel like what I feel mm. is like I can basically watch like a YouTube video or like I can. There's like a website called Udemy and you can just get the course there. Like you can learn mm -hmm. about anything. But the university itself is about like making connections, the experience itself, yeah. socializing, everything. But it just like, I feel like I'm watching like a YouTube video, as I'll say. Yes. <laughs> An 18,000 pound YouTube video. Well, look, I'm glad we got to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Before we yeah. run out of time, I just wanted to give uh, Kyle a chance since we started with you. I want to come back to you, Kyle. Uh, and and uh, you mentioned the idea of, of a partial refund, but also I, I want to know about whether your petition has led to any constructive dialogue with the university that makes you think that you might actually get anywhere with that. I think we will get somewhere, partly because we've raised a lot of concern, concerns about safety. And that's actually what I just wanted to finish up on. Um, it's been ve made very hard for a lot of people to self-isolate across the country. Mm. And we've seen, I think it's even in the petition, that countries or institutions or groups that make it easy to self-isolate deal with the virus much better. Um, we've, we've had like confirmed reports here of people going out, uh, sorry, getting symptoms, panicking. And because they don't know if they can afford food or they're confused, they're going out to the shop. So um, I would actually, if I was a local person knowing this, I'd be really afraid. Mm -hmm. um, I would be really quite wor worried because I do think definitely, especially in the past week, there have been people who will have broken the rules and will have spread this virus. I ex fully expect a spike around Lancaster, around the university in the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Um, and regards to a refund, like I honestly think there wasn't a clear alternative to this. I felt quite strongly that universities should go back in person. Uh, however, I feel that they should have been honest with students. And they should have said, you're going to have very little contact time, probably. Um, it's going to be a very different experience. If that was actually done, then I feel like that would, that would be the only, that's the only realistic alternative. Now that everyone's on campus, and I think it was mentioned before, um, it's very hard to refund people without cutting academic staff. Mm -hmm. And that's something I don't think most students would like to see because it isn't a dispute between 
you know, people who are often on barely above minimum wage and students. It's right. a dispute between this kind of wider institution, this system, and the people who are affected by it. Well, um, thank you very much, Kyle. Good luck with the petition. We're two minutes over. I'm, I'm really sorry, uh, Billy, that I haven't uh, come to you. Uh, but I don't want to extend uh, indefinitely. I just want to, well, thank everybody for your contributions and uh, say a few things in, in closing. One is that we haven't even discussed the mental health of uh, the country's students, and in particular first year students who are dealing with this at the same time as the anxieties attendant on moving away from home, being thrown in with a whole bunch of people you don't know. Um, I hope that for some people, uh, this is an experience that will make you friends for life. Uh, but I think we all worry that for many, it will be scarring for a long time. Um, uh, I take Ella's point, uh, as in her own words, the design of the higher, educa higher education system is not students' fault, especially when you feel, uh, and you can point to the emails, that you have been invited up for a blended learning um, combination that then you find you're not being given uh, uh, running up as the slides showed about eighteen thousand pounds of, of debt per year uh, but I, I want to also thank David Kernahan for pointing out that the moment we move into full or um, partial refund territory there is a human cost at the other end in terms of the salaries and jobs of precisely the people who uh, whose vocation it is to teach students. So uh, there is no easy way out unless government prioritizes, as was suggested, a kind of a furlough scheme for students for, for universities. Um, I think in closing, uh, students and Freshers Week is, is a subject that traditionally is covered on page three of the newspapers. It's about parties. On, on bad days, it's about ketamine overdoses. Um, and I, I don't wish to make light of that. that. That is a tragedy that has happened this week in, uh, in, in Newcastle. But, but this is structural. It's affecting tens of thousands of students and their futures and their debt burdens and the finances of what is supposed to be one of this country's uh, growth uh, knowledge industries, namely further education. So. Um, my distinct sense is that government needs to realise this and get a grip. And I'm very grateful to everybody for joining us to, to explain why. Um, I hope that um, you can have a good weekend wherever you are, despite all this, and get out and not be accosted by too many COVID police. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Ella. And thanks, my colleagues, Phoebe and Liz. Have a great weekend.